Thank you for viewing this forum. My name is Kimberly Crockett, and I'm the political action chair of the Eastern Panhandle Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Together with the membership of the League of Women Voters of Jefferson County, we are pleased to offer you this debate forum for your consideration in the 2020 general election. In this era of COVID-19, we are bringing you this debate forum via Zoom in an effort to educate the larger community about the 2020 general elections and several local offices that are contested races while maintaining appropriate social distancing. Therefore, the EPAC chapter of Deltas and the League of Women Voters thank all of the candidates who participate in the forums this year. We are very pleased to present the candidates today for the 16th Senator Senatorial District, Patricia Rucker and Pete Dougherty. Candidates, we will begin this forum by offering each of you one minute to introduce yourself to the viewers. We will then ask each of you questions submitted by our organization's members, allowing two minutes for your responses. We will signal the need to, or we will, um, signal the need to close your responses with the red signal card, which we reviewed before we began our debate. Uh, finally, we will close with a two minute wrap up for each of you to offer any additional information for the consideration. Let's begin our forum. Uh, Patricia Rucker, if you would take a moment, one minute and introduce yourself to the viewers. Is that right? Um, for inviting me to participate. And obviously, I definitely, as a woman, I'm very happy that to have this opportunity and for you guys to be involved. Uh, I am Patricia Rucker. I am currently the state senator in the 16th district. I'm also a first generation immigrant, mother of five, been married to my husband 24 years, and we live in Harpers Ferry in Jefferson County. The 16th district is all of Jefferson and half of Berkeley, an area in, that is growing in the state. And I have been working really hard uh, since I got elected to help with the growth, facilitate, encourage, um, and have the proper regulations in place. I am a Republican, so I definitely do not want to see taxes increased. I would like to see us have more economic activity and have opportunities for our children to have work here in West Virginia instead of leaving. And I'm happy to answer any questions since I see my time is already up. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rucker. Pete Doherty, if you would also take one minute to introduce yourself to the viewers. Yes, I'm Pete Doherty. I'm a uh, longtime resident of Jefferson County. Uh, I've been in a variety of uh, positions that I think have helped our county. I uh, started out working with the uh, Division of Corrections, worked uh, probation and parole for the 23rd Judicial Circuit. I went on and became a magistrate, was a magistrate for six years, served on the Board of Education for 25 years, 21 of which was I was president of the board. I'm now completing my second uh, full term as sheriff and per the constitution, I'm not allowed to uh, serve longer than that. I have the, uh, the energy and the vigor to uh, continue to provide services to the people of the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the opportunity to go to Charleston. Uh, besides the uh, things that I've mentioned, I also spent 11 years working on the legislative branch of the U.S. House and U.S. Senate and think that that experience would help me uh, working in Charleston. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Darity. Now we will begin our questions. And I'll begin with uh, Mr. Darity. What is your legislative plan for the 16th district should you be elected? Well, there are a variety of problems that West Virginia is facing right now. Obviously, the COVID crisis is, is significant. What that impact will be uh, will be very difficult. But I think a couple of the issues that I think are most important to us is to uh, improving the infrastructure. Uh, the Eastern Panhandle continues to grow. I think we are inadequately uh, uh, in position to uh, take care of that growth. 
our transportation needs are bad and our ability to grow is going to be significantly impacted if we don't do a better job of improving internet access and activity. There was just a report released the other day that said West Virginia became either worst or next to worst in the country as far as having internet access uh, has declined in comparison to others. Uh, I think that after COVID-19, uh, uh, the opportunity for us to grow will be significant, uh, but it will only be significant if we do more to do that. I also think we need to do a better job of, of helping uh, education, particularly public education. And as someone who has both 25 years of serving on a local board and chairing the West Virginia Professional Teaching Standards Commission that's helped set the standards, uh, I know what it takes to uh, improve public education. And I think that that is one of the things that will attract uh, business and industry to us is to show them that we have a place for their children to come and get educated where they can be successful. Thank you, Mr. Dougherty. Ms. Rucker, you have the same question. What is your legislative plan for the 16th district should you be elected? Thank you so much. So um, I'm grateful that uh, you know, Pete Doherty agrees with some of the things that I've been talking about. Um, obviously, education is number one for me, had al has always been, and it's one of the core components of why I even ran for office. And gratefully, in the last two years, I've been able to serve as Senate Education Chair and have been pushing for education reform, uh, innovation, local control, higher teacher salaries, and to have the ability in West Virginia to implement some school choice. So we've been working and there's a whole lot more to do. Of course, education also involves our higher education. And I've been very fortunate to be in a position to help bring more money to Blue Ridge and Shepherd College, two important higher education systems that we have. And I've also helped get a bill passed to help fund higher education for those who might not necessarily be able to afford it, be it two year or four year. And I want to keep pushing for that. And I agree that infrastructure is very important. And broadband is become even more important now with the COVID and what we're dealing with, not just for education, but also for jobs. We absolutely need to expand broadband capability here in the Eastern Panhandle. And that refers to the third most important thing. I believe jobs are important in our area. When speaking with constituents, the number one concern that most parents give me is that they want their kids to be able to stay here in West Virginia. And that means they need jobs, good paying jobs. So obviously need to work towards expanding those opportunities. We've already been pushing several small business initiatives, but we need to make certain we have an environment that allows businesses to come here and job creators to create more jobs and to invest more here locally. Thank you, Ms. Rucker. Our second question is, as I'm sure you're aware, numerous states have introduced bills and passed them um, banning hair discrimination through the Crown Act, an acronym for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. West Virginia Senate Bill 850 uh, was presented and um, did not pass, it was defeated. And it was a ban that would have, or it was a bill that would have banned hair discrimination in West Virginia schools and workplaces. Uh, if elected, will you introduce or support a new bill that would make it illegal to discriminate against a person for their hair texture and style? If so, why? Um, Ms. Rucker, we'll begin with you this time. Thank you very much. I believe I was a co-sponsor on that legislation that didn't make it through this past time. Um, I can't pledge to sponsor a bill, but I will tell you that I'm against discrimination, which is obviously something very important we need to protect and treat everybody equally. So whatever new bill um, comes through, I will definitely consider supporting it as long as it's written the right way. Thank you, Ms. Rucker. And Mr. Dougherty, uh, same question, and I'll repeat it. As I'm sure you're aware, numerous states have introduced and passed bills banning hair discrimination through the Crown Act, an acronym for creating 
a respectful and open world for natural hair. West Virginia Senate Bill 850, a bill to ban hair discrimination in West Virginia schools and workplaces was defeated early this year. If elected, will you support a new bill that would make it illegal to discriminate against a person for their hair texture and styles and why? Well, the, the simple answer is yes. Uh, I, would, uh, I would be uh, hypocritical if I did anything other than to say that I am against discrimination in any manner, shape, or form that it comes in. Uh, the, I don't see anything and have not heard anything as to why this uh, should be uh, uh, allowed to occur and would definitely be willing to sponsor or support a bill that would remove uh, that discriminatory language. Thank you, Mr. Dougherty. As a follow-up, Ms. Rucker, um, as a co-sponsor, if this bill comes up again, what can you do to increase a more broad coalition so that we can see a bill like this pass? And Mr. Dougherty, the same question, if elected, what can you do to, to reach across and uh, increase uh, support for a bill like this? Ms. Rucker, if you'll um, complete your answer on that. Okay, so I can tell you that already, if you look at the legislation that the Senate introduced and put forward, it was already had Republicans and Democrats on it. I believe if we um, work together, we can find uniformity and agreement. And a lot of think that that is one of the hurts us in the legislature. We take issues that should not be partisan and we try to make them partisan in order to win some sort of political points. I can tell you that I try not to do that. And I really do try to look on what's best for my constituents, for West Virginia. And that's how I determine whether or not a bill deserves my attention and support. And I think that most of our legislators, fortunately, in Charleston also uh, approach things that way. Thank you for that follow-up. Mr. Dougherty, if elected, what would you do to um, increase the support for a bill like this? Well, I, I've worked in the legislative branch uh, for many years, so I'm familiar with uh, sort of partisan bickering, uh, but I think if you look at the things that I have worked on and the legislation that I have helped to create and support, uh, it's really been bipartisan. I'm a person who believes that the best way to move forward is not to stand in, in the corner and argue and, and not get something done. It is to come to whatever agreement you can to get a bill passed, even if it's not perfect, to move it forward. And so I think that if you look at my, uh, uh, my history, and my, my work, that you will find that I am not a partisan and that I will not engage in just simply partisan uh, politics. Um, you, you know, I, I agree with Ms. Rucker that, that uh, this is uh, something that I think is a bipartisan nature, but I will also note that uh, uh, while it has sponsorship on both sides, uh, the Republicans obviously have controlled the legislative branch and it didn't get passed. So I'm hoping maybe if I get there, I can help get a few more votes uh, uh, on the right side. Thank you, Mr. Dougherty. Our next question, what is your position on increasing the minimum wage for hardworking people in West Virginia? Uh, Mr. Dougherty, you will take that question first. Well, raising the minimum wage, I think, is an important thing and needs to be done. And, and let me tell you what the argument is, because I've been involved with this issue for, for 35 years. The argument that people always say is, well, gee, we can't really afford to do it. The problem that we have in some cases is if you don't raise the minimum wage, then taxpayers are going to have to pay and subsidize for other things that that, that family needs. I think it's important for us to recognize that while there is a cost of doing it, that you must be able to provide an amount of money that a family and a person can live on in doing that. That doesn't discount the fact that there may be a student minimum wage where you're not a wage earner and not taking care of a family. 
But by and large, I think what needs to be done is that we need to pay people a an amount of money that is reasonable for them to live on. Uh, otherwise, we're defeating the uh, the purpose. We're subsidizing uh, the cost to to the uh, general government, to other taxpayers, to take care of things that that person cannot take care of by their own wage. Thank you, Mr. Darity. And Ms. Rucker, you also have the same question. What is your position on increasing the minimum wage for hardworking people in West Virginia? I think there is a right way of increasing the minimum wage and a wrong way. I think that the government dictating what wages should be, be it uh, statewide or, or you know, na nationally, is the wrong way. I think the right way of increasing minimum wage is for competition and a free market, and obviously encouraging an educated, prepared workforce. And that is the role of government. So we get, have better prepared, educated citizens that can do better paying jobs. And we also encourage that vibrant free market uh, system so that businesses have to compete for employees. And those wages rise, and they rise a lot faster than anything we could guarantee by government. When we try to uh, dictate a certain wage that's a minimum wage, what I have found is it hurts young people like my children who are college age, and they could not find jobs because either companies that usually provide jobs to those college students are going through electronic routes and automated routes. And I'm sure all of you guys have been to Walmart and you see that now it's difficult to get in a checkout line that is not an automated line. Or their jobs that they normally had are being given to people who can work full time year round versus college students that just work in the summer. So that's one of the drawbacks of dictating a minimum wage. It actually hurts those wage owners who, who are young, who need the experience, who may not necessarily be able to work full time, um, and they, businesses are finding other ways to fill those jobs. So I support higher wages to the competitive marketplace. Thank you, Ms. Rucker. Uh, Mr. Dougherty, I believe um, you answered that question first. So this time, Ms. Rucker, you'll take the next question first, okay? The question is, would you support legislation to improve the quality of community policing? For example, mandating continuing training on implicit bias and diversity and increasing training on use of force. Okay, it's kind of multiple questions in one. So I absolutely support increasing uh, funding for community policing and increasing our safety network period. Um, in terms of making mandates, I'm not sure whether or not that is something I would support. It would depend on um, exactly what is being offered now. And is that sufficient? Do we need to fix it? Is it something that is needs transformation or tweaking. Um, absolutely feel it's important that, of course, our police force and all of our first responders get adequate training. And definitely, I'm very grateful to say, I'm here in West Virginia, I have not seen the racial bias that obviously is happening in other places and anything we can do to prevent that. Um, I think our police have done an excellent job here, uh, both locally, county, municipal and state police in um, the way that they treat their citizens. It doesn't mean we can't improve, but I'm not certain I can support mandating, especially if it's not tied to being fully funded. I certainly do not want to take money away from the police cruisers and the ability that they need to pay their officers enough. Um, I think all of the things that the police need, they probably are best um, equipped to know what it is that the funding should go for. But I would definitely be happy to consider it if that is something that is needed. Thank you, Ms. Rucker. Uh, Mr. Dougherty, the same question. Would you support legislation to improve the quality of community policing, for example, uh, mandating continuing training on implicit bias and diversity, and increasing training on use of force? First of all, <clears throat> the, uh, the police already have mandatory training requirements. And as a result of that, uh, I can tell you in my office, 
uh, we have basically quadrupled the amount of training that officers get. Uh, I take every opportunity I can to get them into training. And just recently, uh, not only did I uh, support my deputies going to a training that goes to exactly to the point that you've made, but I also provided some funding because I'm, I do some fiscal uh, uh, responsibility for the region uh, to help underwrite the cost of some municipal officers to go to that training as well. Our job in law enforcement, and I'm speaking now because I'm currently the sheriff, is to do the best we can to treat everyone as fairly as we can and to come at the situation with an open head and an open mind and not to be discriminatory in our thought process or in our action. And the way you do that is you increase training. Whether it's legislative, I'm not sure I want the legislature to create training. I think that uh, we have a law enforcement uh, professional standards commission and they do that kind of work. Uh, I've been involved with them, the sheriffs and, and police and so on are involved with that. I'm certainly happy that we do that and I'm certainly supportive of there being more mandatory training for, that, uh, for those causes. Thank you, Mr. Darity. Our next question is, how important do you believe public libraries are to the citizens of West Virginia? And if you believe they are important, how do you intend to see that they thrive in the future? I believe, uh, Mr. Darity, it is your turn to answer the question first. Uh, I've been a supporter of public libraries for a long time. When I was on the Board of Education, uh, we put some uh, funding in to help support the local libraries at Harpers Ferry and Shepherdstown and, and uh, uh, Summit Point uh, into the excess levy because we thought that that was an extension of the uh, public education system. Uh, I've also supported uh, uh, the libraries in other ways, in, in personal donation and so on as well. One of the things that West Virginia has is we, we have a minimal amount of money that we are collecting at the uh, state level and basically are leaving it to, to, the, uh, to the locals, um, which means that some counties have run library uh, levies and some have not. Some have incorporated some funding for libraries into that. I think that there needs to be a more comprehensive way to look at what the needs of libraries are and to do that. In a positive way, I will tell you that libraries have done a great job of over the years of not being isolated, uh, but they share information, they share resources, and you know, 30 years ago, if you went to a little local library, all you got was what the local library is. Now they have an ability to get information back and forth. The other is that libraries are changing more from hard books into an electronic system, and we ought to do more for that. But, but last and, and foremost, particularly for, for those of us who are concerned about education, is libraries also are many times a place where a student can go to get access to both research and information and access to internet services, which are very important more and more as we go forward uh, with education. But I think this is an issue that uh, I'm happy to, to get further involved with and to see because West Virginia funds very little for libraries at the state level. Thank you, Mr. Darity. Ms. Rucker, the same question. How important do you believe public libraries are to the citizens of West Virginia? And if you believe it is important, how do you intend to see that they thrive in the future? Thank you for that question. Libraries are super important. Uh, they're vital, actually. And for the many, many citizens who, like me, do not get good internet at home, uh, like uh, Pete mentioned, they are extremely important as an access point to get internet, to do essential business, to do school projects and everything else. So I definitely believe that um, they're really important. And in terms of the funding, it's just like Pete said. So right now it's, it's really county by county and different ways that they find to fund it. But I have tried and uh, Library Association knows 
my, I so definitely support them getting individual independent funding so that they be their own line item and they're not dependent on, you know, what certain counties decide to give them and based on how much they're able to collect, but that they know what their funding is and they'll be a stable source. I also have to say, I mean, they, libraries do an excellent job with what they have and I think that the community does support it too, and that that's crucial. So definitely don't want to take away from individual communities who want to support their libraries through their own donations and methods. But I do believe that it's important for, you know, any essential business to, to know what base funding is going to be so that they can make plans. And I definitely support them getting that. I'm happy to say that we've been able to, at the very least, help them when it comes to connectivity and when it comes to working together. So there's been a few bills that have passed in the last few years to help our local libraries be able to work together as a team and collaborate on things and um, obviously any way that I can help them because they are so important. Thank you, Ms. Rucker. You'll also take the next question. Um, lack of access to sanitary and feminine hygiene products can be a barrier to school and workforce attendance. If elected, would you support a tax exemption of these products? Hmm, nobody has ever mentioned that to me. Um, I, I would consider it. Um, that's, that's an idea that hasn't come up um, yet. So that's an interesting concept of a way to get it and make it easier. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you for keeping an open mind. <laughs> Mr. Darity, same question. Lack of access to sanitary and feminine hygiene products can be a barrier to school and workforce attendance. If elected, would you support state tax exemption of these products? Uh, I, I agree with uh, Patricia that that's a question I had not really anticipated. Uh, I don't have any negative uh, view of, of taking the tax off of those products. Um, and, and certainly if I'm elected, I'll, I'll take a look and see what both the uh, financial implications are for the state and what the benefit is to, uh, uh, to those that need those, uh, those products. And again, thank you for keeping an open mind on that issue. I know our schools do the best they can to assist young girls in particular um, so that it doesn't interfere with their educational pro um, progress, but um, keeping an open mind about making those products tax exempt is, um, is, an, is something to consider. Um, and our final question, uh, Mr. Dougherty, you'll take this one first. In light of the needs brought on by COVID-19, what are your plans to address the repercussions of the pandemic on the 16th district via allocating funding or other services that will impact areas such as physical and behavioral health, domestic abuse, election security, feeding school age kids in need, assisting first responders, and those needing childcare help uh, who have returned to work? It, this is a uh, this is a huge problem, uh, and it's a problem we all know that at some point we will get out of, but uh, it, we're not going to get out of it in the next few weeks, and we may not get out of it for for a year. So it's a very very good question to ask. Uh, I can tell you because I do this every day. We we are seeing an increase in in the number of domestic violence cases. We're seeing a number of increases in, in fights and those kinds of things. Um, we, 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 I've, I've been in the area of working with mental health and substance abuse my entire life. And we're not doing enough and certainly not enough at the state level to help us get uh, these problems resolved. There's not enough access and availability uh, particularly on mental health services. There are some good things that are happening and we're moving in the right direction. There's a, a good effort going on locally about improving uh, telemental health services and getting access to services that way. But the, but the reality is that we've really sort of stumbled across and moved forward uh, without a real plan in place. Um, you know, we didn't, we didn't do a very good job in my estimation when the COVID crisis first came upon us to tighten it down. 
Uh, everybody said, oh, it's going to go away real quickly. It's not really a big problem. We now have over 300 West Virginians that have died and over 13,000 that are infected. And, and it looks like the problem is going to get worse. I just saw a report today that said we're basically in the first six months of, and we probably have nine more months to go. That's not very good for us to address. Uh, those of us who are in first responder positions, uh, it's very difficult for us to do that. Uh, having enough uh, equipment is, is critical, but what we need to do is we need to have a comprehensive plan that takes the local perspective into it and gets a state response. Thank you, Mr. Dougherty. And Ms. Rucker, you also have the same question. In light of the needs brought on by COVID-19, what are your plans to address the repercussions of the pandemic in the 16th district via allocating funding or other services that will impact areas such as physical and behavioral health, domestic abuse, election security, feeding school age kids in need, assisting first responders and those needing childcare who have returned to work? Thank you so much for the question. That obviously is kind of the predominant thing we've been dealing with for the last few months. And I am happy to say that the legislature before it left the session, um, almost on the last day when we were passing the budget, we did provide some funding ahead of time, but we did not know how bad uh, pandemic would be. But we, we had heard that, you know, this COVID, you know, was a virus and it was definitely coming to the United States and we provided some funding ahead of time. Obviously now it's a, it's a much bigger thing than anyone could have pictured. And I have to say, I'm really grateful for the way that the governor, DHHR, our emergency services, and our community has been working together to address all of those different needs. Oh, and I forgot to mention the Department of Education. So both then and now, we have community to working together in partnership so that we are on the same page and we are trying to get those needs addressed. So most of the pressure falls on DHHR. Those things that you mentioned about mental health services, feeding the poor, um, those type of things all go through DHHR and they have received increased funding from the federal government and also from the state are fully supporting them and helping them to expand. They are also got overwhelmed in the unemployment office in Workforce West Virginia. And we literally pulled people from different agencies and brought them in. We have the National Guard stepping in to help process forms to try to get those unemployment claims to the folks as fast as possible. And we have to continue all hands on deck type of, you know, attention to this. It is super important. And of course, right now in education, we are dealing with blended models almost throughout the state. Most of the state is doing an option of virtual or they're doing in-class learning. And then there are some counties that have had to stop the in-class learning completely. So as Senate Education Chair, it's my priority to make certain that the schools get the PPE that they need and that they be able to provide those kids an education. And that's super important that we need to do. Didn't even get to daycare, sorry. Ran out of time. Thank you. Thank you both of you for, for your responses to those questions. Um, now, each of our candidates will have two minutes to offer any additional information for consideration by our viewers. Um, I believe we started with Mr. Dougherty introducing himself first. So, Ms. Rucker, this time, if you would take that two minutes to tell the viewers anything else that you want them to, to consider for the election. Thank you so much. And thank you again for the opportunity. I want to thank the league. I will tell you, I am just a stay at home mom. That's how I think of myself, who really is passionate about helping West Virginia be the best place it could be. I want my kids to have jobs here, to be able to stay here in West Virginia. I want everyone to feel that you know they can fulfill their dreams. And this is a dream for me. I'm literally living the American dream as a, as a first generation immigrant legislator, uh, honored to be able to serve and give back to the incredible opportunities I've been given. I really want to help us to be able to improve education, to provide jobs, to have um, 
you know, life here in West Virginia where we feel safe, um, not just from illness, but also you know, persons um, in our properties. I thank our police officers for the work that they're doing and all of our first responders who are doing a great job. Um, we're, we, we can do better, there's no question in all areas, but it's really a great opportunity to be able to serve and give back. And in terms of my upcoming priorities, I have to tell you, there's a lot more we need to do. I, I really believe we have the people and the resources in the state of West Virginia to be able to be one of the best. I mean, there is nothing that is holding us back except ourselves. And I know the awesome people that I live with and work with, and I know we are going to get over this crisis, this, this pandemic, and we're gonna come out stronger because we are um, hardworking, we are industrious, we, are, um, we love people, and this is an area that um, just helps their neighbors. And I really wanna just keep working to make this place the best. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Rucker. Um, Mr. Darity, if you would do the same, just take two minutes to um, share with the viewers anything additional you'd like them to consider um, when they go to the ballot box. Well, I've been in West Virginia for 50 years. Um, I went to uh, school in West Virginia. I went to college in West Virginia, uh, at a small college in the middle of the state, Davidson Elkins College, uh, took graduate uh, classes through West Virginia University. I've been here in Jefferson County since 1975. And I've, I've, I love West Virginia. It is home and home is where your heart is. And that's why I'm here. Now, you know, in, in, in all candor, Ms. Rucker was uh, pointing out a moment ago how uh, the legislature, you know, sort of in its wisdom, it put some money in at the end. Uh, it was $8 million. So it wasn't very much to address what the uh, COVID 19 response would be. She also has not supported having the legislature go back in and try to address those needs. I'm a person who has been uh, deployed when 9 11 happened. I was part of the continuation of government. I was uh, part of the uh, effort at the national level when Katrina happened in, uh, in New Orleans. I'm a person who has spent most of my life dealing with faith based and community. Uh, organizations uh, because I've run grant programs that help provide housing and services to veterans. Uh, I worked on uh, under the Bush administration as a White House liaison for the Department of Veterans Affairs. I'm a person who sees a crisis and tries to deal with the crisis and I think that what you need in this legislature is more people who have not only good intention but good experience in solving problems. And we've got to go forward and we've got to solve this problem. We've got to get the economy back. But you know, we, we, we've, we've, we've failed in many ways. I mean, schools are open and some of them don't have good ventilation. Some of them don't have enough personal uh, uh, protection for the employees. We're, we're getting a lot of folks who, who are going to get sick and unfortunately die and we've got to do a better job of it, and we've, it really has to be part of it at the state level. I hope to be part of that solution. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dougherty. And thank you to both of you, our candidates for State Senate, Patricia Rucker and Pete Dougherty. Thank you for taking time to speak with us today about your candidacy and these very important issues facing our communities. And to our viewers, the general election occurs on November 3rd. The last day you have to register to vote in the general election is October 13th. Early voting runs from October 21st through October 31st, including Saturdays. Uh, and for those who are concerned about voting in person, in order to vote by absentee, absentee ballot, you must apply for a ballot. Concerns for exposure to COVID-19 is a valid basis to request a ballot under other medical reasons which keep me confined. The last day to apply for an absentee ballot for the general election is October 28, 2020. The application is available online through the Secretary of State's office. And if you request a ballot and then decide to vote in person, you need to bring your ballot back to the polling place with you when you cast your ballot 
or otherwise your um, ballot cast in person will be considered a provisional ballot until they determine that the absentee ballot was not submitted. So um, on behalf of the membership of the League of Women Voters of Jefferson County and the members of the Eastern Panhandle Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, we would like to thank you for viewing this virtual debate forum. We have recorded debate forums for a number of additional contested races in the 2020 general election that are available on the Facebook pages of both the League of Women Voters and Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. Thank you for viewing.